Hey there, folks. My name is Scarebro, and we're here to review ISOM number one, an independent comic written and published by Eric D. July. We're going to dive right in, but first, if you like the content, I'd like you to hit that like and subscribe button. It helps the algorithm spread content around the platform, and you can follow me on other alternative platforms such as Rumble. Links are included in the description below. In this review, I will briefly go over the creators and then talk about the story, characters, and artwork, and give my impressions and conclusions. I may reference art while going over the story and vice versa because comics is a visual storytelling medium where one part informs the other. I am not a professional in the industry, but I have had a deep love of comics for most of my life and still have an interest in the production of comics, the process, uh, for my own enjoyment, if nothing else. So back to the comic. As I said earlier, Isom is an independent comic written by YouTuber and social media personality Eric D. July. I don't have much info about Eric July, but I believe this is his first fiction writing endeavor. I believe he is a capital L libertarian, and he's definitely taken up a flag in the ongoing culture war in geek media, and Isom is his first salvo. If I'm wrong about any of this, please feel free to correct me in the comments below. The comic is equal parts a first-time foray into the comic book publishing space and a response to the mainstream comic industry's own offerings, which have been heavily criticized by fans for being overly political and putting ideology over entertainment and economic success. Overall, I'd say that the comic is a good first try, despite the pedigree of the comic. I think it falls a little short. If I had to guess, I would say having a seasoned editor in the creative process to review the different pieces of the comic before bringing them together would have helped the final product. The interior artwork was done by Cliff Richards, who appears to be a veteran artist in the industry. I didn't know him by name and had to go through his Wikipedia article and Comic Vine page to find credits to review his earlier work. I definitely recognized Sojourn amongst the credits from the defunct cross-gen comics, but all his other credits are from various IPs such as Buffy, The Vampire Slayer, and DC Comics. Coloring was done by Gabe El Taib, a very seasoned colorist in the industry. I also had to go back through his credits to see what I recognized in his previous works. And actually, I remember some of these. Um, I actually have very fond memories of the Green Lantern Corps. Even if the writing is a first attempt at producing a comic book, the talent is definitely there in the interior artwork and coloring. The primary cover was done by an artist named Turnian, who I have no idea who that is. I tried Googling this person and couldn't find any sort of gallery. I'll be referencing this cover regularly though, since it was one of the primary marketing materials for the campaign itself. The pitch for Isom gets ahead of what's actually disclosed in the story. I think I need to read it in full to go over what's actually in the book. Avery Silman was once an entry-level hero known as Isom in the city of Floresspark, Texas, shortly after gaining his special abilities. A certain event had him hang up his suit, and now he stays on the outskirts of the city, living as a rancher. Avery's sister, Altona, gives him a call and wants him to visit an old friend by the name of Darren Fontano. Another family friend that was interning with Altona has gone missing, and she last heard that she was dealing with Darren. But Darren has much changed since he was hanging out with Avery when they were young. He's a cold-blooded shot caller and one of the most feared men in the city. The visit turns into one of the longest days in Avery's life. Around these parts, people call special beings excepts, and unfortunately for Avery, he has the luxury of running into some of them. The Alpha Corps and Yera have their own set of conflicts. A man built like a tank by the name of Santuan reappears, and he's had previous confrontation with Avery. So what happens with Avery and Darren's meeting? Who and where is the family friend? Just grab ISOM number one, ill-advised part one, to find out for yourself. It's a good pitch, but not as meaty as what is actually delivered. The story beats are kind of there, but there aren't any hooks that make you excited for the next comic. It seems to heavily rely on the audience's foreknowledge that the main character is the hero of the story, and therefore we should immediately take a liking to him and agree with his perspective and actions, no matter how much they defy common sense. Now this is a hard line to tread when analyzing a character. A main character is not meant to be a reflection of the reader. 
but they should be someone their audience can connect with as they are riding sidecar through the story, especially when that character is meant to be a hero. The main character is Isom, or Avery Silman. The name Isom isn't used anywhere in the story. There's very little substance to his journey. His mission is one he begrudgingly accepts. He only does it because his mother would be upset with him for not trying to find Jasmine, the daughter of a woman who was a pillar of the community in his old life. His old life that his inner monologue reveals he specifically left behind when he left the city. In fact, the conflict in the story only has momentum because Avery feels disrespected by Darren. His own inner monologue says he almost forgot about the girl he's looking for, and that Darren talking down to him will not go unaddressed, quote unquote. Even after he accidentally bumps into the girl he's looking for and acts concerned, he immediately forgets about her when he's accosted by Darren's guards and she flees. After beating up the guards, he demands to be taken to Darren. He's completely forgotten about the girl. Afterwards, knowing Darren will take revenge, he decides to push Jasmine aside to protect his own family. Overall, there's little reason to root for his success beyond knowing that he is the main character and the hero of the story. Despite having the foresight to know Darren will take action against his family, he still decides to go up against whatever organization Darren is running. Not even for the greater good of finding a missing girl, but because he was disrespected. The comic is about 96 pages, which is three times the length of your standard issue floppy comic, which means you have about three issues to tell a story. A lot of pages are spent not telling the narrative. I guess their purpose is world building, but instead of spending four pages showing off Yevra, the blonde powerhouse, and Alpha Corps, which I think is a government endorsed super police, you could have dedicated a page depicting a battle between the two, or maybe a spread and teasing the characters through a piece of media, such as a news report or social media post. Just enough to show them off to the buyers of the first book without directing focus for my son. Likewise, some pages could be saved if instead of Yeaver encountering Avery and dropping him from a great height and a dramatic landing, the same result is from the first beating that Santuan gives him. That's about another six pages conserved right there. There are other examples further in the book, but I think I've made my point. The whole match and then rematch between Avery and Santuan reminds me of Thor number 433 from 1991, which is the first issue of Eric Masterson playing as the God of Thunder with a new look. Within 23 pages, the character gets beaten, gets a costume redesign, and a rematch with Ulig, the leader of the Rock Trolls, proving himself to be a good replacement for the original Thor. That kind of shows how much time and pages are wasted telling the initial story. If I had to pace this, I would have had the first act end in a beating by San Juan, who I think outclassed Avery physically. The middle section would have been Avery escaping the hospital, but from there I would have had a hard time figuring out what he would do. Darren's recollection of his childhood paints Avery as unassuming. He never stood out and he kept to himself, so we're told little about his character except that he ran away from his past and he does not like being disrespected, and he's pragmatic in nature. Could he spend time figuring out where Jasmine is and what Darren's up to like he intended? No matter what he does in the middle part, he should get his costume. He already came to the conclusion at the end of the actual book that he needs it. The hospital could be a more sobering experience than it comes across and he could request it back and get the upgraded version at the end of the second act, complete with the fall damage resistance he wants. The third act should be rescuing Jasmine and a rematch with Santuan in costume. Donning the costume could be a pragmatic compromise if it had a mask, at least initially. It's clear Avery doesn't want to go back to the costume life, and he's smart enough to know that messing with Darren would have repercussions. After beating Santuan and saving the girl, Avery believes he is safe, but he is not. Darren discovers who the masked man is and decides to make it personal, and that cliffhanger could lead to ISOM number two. There are some minor quibbles, such as the comic immediately starting with the two weeks ago heading but never coming back to the present. There's no point to that framing as we are never given a present in the book. I've already spoken at length about Avery's character. I'd like to talk about his character design instead. I'm curious if a character model sheet was produced before the comic was drawn. Avery's features are a bit everyman, but even Peter Parker, another everyman, has some telltale character features, his hairstyle being the most prominent that set him apart from the rest of the characters in his comic. Avery seems to stand out only because he wears a red shirt or hoodie for most of the comic. Avery's beard might be a primary characteristic, but it feels too subtle 
and is drawn inconsistently. The nature of Avery's powers are also very confusing. He's obviously strong and durable, but is he faster than normal? He doesn't appear to be, as a larger opponent was able to keep up with him and Yera took him completely off guard. He does not appear to be particularly agile. He does not appear to be any stronger than Santuan. That being said, I have no idea what type of comic Eric July is going for. A character does not necessarily need exceptional powers that outclass other super-powered beings to be a good character. There are plenty of characters with a relatively mediocre level of power, but are exceptional in other ways. One of my favorite characters was Hitman, where the character was an exceptional normie Hitman before getting minor telepathy and x-ray vision, which brought him into the realm of superheroes. Darren is perhaps my favorite character. He has a more distinct appearance than any other character in the book. A white suit, gold chains, and distinctive beard and hairstyle that set him apart from all the other characters. July seems to be threading the needle on Darren being a kingpin-like character, or perhaps a proto-kingpin. The kingpin himself began as a low-ranking criminal who became a cultured criminal manipulator. But Darren's characterization is not quite there yet. But he's not as thuggish as Marvel's Tombstone, who was the kingpin's top hitman and fancied himself a leader in his own right, but willing to get his hands dirty. Darren knows his origins, and knows how far he's come, and that he feels he's worked hard to get where he is, and like Avery, suffers no disrespect. Like any leader of a criminal group, he's ready to deal harshly with those that flout his authority. First, I want to say that I tried to get a PDF copy of this from the author, but I did not get a response. A PDF with no text would have sufficed, so I resorted to taking photographs without bending the book. So there is some warping and there is some glare from the glossy pages, but hopefully it won't detract from my points. As I said earlier, I didn't know who Cliff Richards was when I read the credits initially, but going through his past work, I recognized a few titles. Obviously, he's worked on some mainstream titles, but at this point, who hasn't? Unless you're credited with specific runs, it's hard to get noticed for working for the big two anymore. But I recognized Sojourn, which was a comic put out by Crossjourn in the 2000s. Specifically, Cliff Richards is credited for the interiors on Sojourn No. 30, published in 2004. Comparing the two works, it feels like Cliff Richards was more on his game in 2004 than he is here. I don't know anything about Richards' process, so I don't want to guess whether he's doing digital or physical media. He's the only one listed as the artist, so unlike in Sojourn No. 30, he's doing the inking. Compared to that, there's something about Isom's art that doesn't pop out or it could be color, or it could be poor editorial direction. It's hard to separate blame in some areas. For instance, on this page, most of it works until the last panel. Or the third panel on this page. And this really threw me. It feels like parking spaces for nothing bigger than a motorcycle. But what really felt off was some of the sequential storytelling. As I said earlier, comics is a visual medium for telling a story, and so each panel has to tell the next sequence of action. I first noticed problems with Yeira's introduction. From the full page to the second panel, there's a clean transition, but the punch from the flying guy is never telegraphed. It just happens. Who is he? Where did he come from? Then from panel six to seven, directionality is all over the place. The woman in green is ascending, but the next panel makes it feel like the action is parallel to the ground. It took me a few moments of confusion to realize that the panel was on its side. You can see other errors in Avery's fight in the club. From this page, you can see all the guards encroaching on him. But the guard on the far right is given exceptional detail to the rest. Because in the following four panels, he gets hit so hard you'd think his sternum was broken, and he's bleeding. But then in the fifth panel, he seems to be back up after getting punched so hard he ruptured blood. If I had to pick on color, I would say that the color during the club fight makes the action hard to follow. I could not tell you who this guy is being thrown from the previous panel, whether he's anyone in that panel, and if he's the guy in the yellow shirt in the following panel. It could either be a poor choice in doing flashing club colors, and also generic thug design. I know the character is a throwaway, and the generic design of the characters is equally detrimental, but they both come together to disrupt the ability to follow the action between panels. Otherwise, I think Gabe El Taib did a good job with the color. One of the biggest crimes, though, was the introduction of San Juan. When I saw the original cover for Isom, I had an immediate idea of the characters before even hearing the pitch. The hero in the middle, 
the right screamed crime boss and the left screamed enforcer. Darren's image was consistent and iconic to me. The white suit, the hair, the chains. When I read the book, I immediately paired the two together. San Juan was not as good, but carried with it recognizable features. The gold teeth reminded me of Jaws from the Bond film series. However, the first two pages of San Juan does not show him smiling. He doesn't smile till the third page. Even then, I wasn't sure if the teeth were a coloring error. He looked nothing like the cover art. Different head shape, different facial structure, different hairstyle. He didn't even have Merc Security written on his shirt. And the reveal of the teeth was so understated compared to the cover's focus, with the hands adding additional emphasis. Overall, the art has a weird annual feel to it. I'm not talking about how crappy modern annual issues of comics likely are now. I wouldn't know. I stopped buying annual issues years ago. I'm talking about the annuals from the 90s and the early 2000s, where something was just off because the artists weren't top tier and were hired to either cut their teeth or take on extra work for the one-off annual issues. Either they weren't matching talent together properly, or editorial control was more lackluster because the annual books were just more work on top of the normal issues being released. So wrapping things up, I'm probably going to catch a lot of hell for this, but Isom has a lot of potential that just wasn't met on the first attempt. The physical product is fine. Paper and binding quality are what I would expect of any graphic novel in the modern era. But the actual content of the book, the art and the story that fills the pages, misses the mark. It feels like the story could have been tighter, and the art could have done the story more justice had there been a veteran editor in the mix. I spoke with someone else about the comic who bought it, and one of our major concerns is that Eric July is going to have too many fans interested in having the comic succeed, and that any valid criticism is not going to reach the ears of him and his creative team. Hopefully this criticism is timely enough for the development of ISOM number 2 or number 3 to be nurtured by it. And that's going to be it, folks. Please subscribe for further content. I'm going to start reviewing more independent comics as I acquire them, and I have other things in the mix. I'll see you next time.